Did, did y'all look up a translation or somewhere to find out what this is about? Many tears from my eyes have fallen in the snow. Its cold flakes absorb thirstily the burning grief <coughs> or searing pain. But they would be more like not physical pain, so like somebody poking me, but uh, an internal one. So grief might be a better word for that. What do you like, Lamprini, for the, how would you do Isis day? How would you handle that? It means, I mean, for an burning, burning pain, but V is like a different, I don't really know how to, how to put it precisely. It's not yeah. exactly a pain. It's Ache, me maybe. Yeah. It yeah. causes me pain. Pain works, I think. Pain, I mean, pain is like the, off the top of my head, but, mm -hmm. you know, it. I wrote down grief on here as one way, but, I don't know, pain. Grief is not, that's <clears throat> column, right? Yeah. But pain, I think, is good, as long as we know it's psychological yeah. in this case. Hot. I like other words. I like burning a little better than hot. Or searing makes it really. Mm -hmm. Ice of a. This is a, this is something pretty bad. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you notice about the text? Some uh, just interesting things about it. First of all, somebody's crying in the snow. <laughs> The protagonist here is crying and drops are falling in the snow. <coughs> They're absorbed by the snow. The contrast between the, like, the heat and the cold. Yeah. It's not mm -hmm. Heise, and then just the coldness. Kalten, Flocken. So we've got cold flakes here. Yeah. Hot and cold juxtaposed. And with it, the, the pain with the hot. And so what do you make of the absorbing, the cold absorbing the tears? Does that mean something to you? What are you going to say? Um, well, right now I just thought of, you know, the snow is absorbing the tears, but it's not doing anything to the snow. So there's no effect, like, no, like, Kind of like nobody sees really what's going on inside of why he's crying or what's really going on. Like everything is the same. Like they just absorb it. Yeah, if you've ever seen a drop fall down, <coughs> it's like where did it go? It just yeah, kind of it's like fear that absorbed it. Yeah, it's like his tears aren't. His burning heart isn't melting the snow. His tears aren't melting the snow. Mm -hmm. Which might be kind of like he's getting no feeling of sympathy from anyone around him, yeah. and as you know, if you know the winter rise, or winter's journey, I guess you could call it, this whole cycle, <coughs> it's about this guy who's wandering around, and it's kind of like, you know, there are images of him outside the house of his former love, and it's warm in there, and it's the, the light shining in the evening, <laughs> in the night, and he's outside in the cold, so it's all, you know, they're doing great, but nobody even sees me out here in the dark. You know, there are these images of this wandering person, and maybe it's like, yeah, nobody really gets it. And it's sort of lost. My grief is lost or just absorbed as a good way. Yeah, like, you know, like his love doesn't, doesn't care about him anymore. Mm -hmm. so. It's cold and unresponsive to his grief. Yeah. It just kind of takes it in and it disappears in that. Is that hopeful then? Maybe. Can we read it that way? Yeah. If it absorbs it, well, then his, his, the heat is gone, absorbed by the snow. That way. I kind of took it as the snow was his only companion at this point. Like <laughs> nobody else is around. All he has is the snow. He's out in the cold. <laughs> well, it's I'm in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is very sad. I don't know. Um, as I looked at the the piece as a whole, um, but I would starting with this idea. I would probably take it as the snow is is taking his lover with his tears. Gone. I mean, he might be leaving him, but he's not happy about that. Because mm -hmm. um, the the piece modulates into the relative major, and the lyrics are a little happier during that period of time. Mm -hmm. um, in the second phrase in the back page. True. Um, and then at the very end of it, he modulates back into C. Well, he d does a direct modulation back into C minor as he realizes 
that's where my sweetheart lives and I'm not there or <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, quickly get to back to see why they just a matter of two, two bars. The last two are back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you make of that? Um, I don't know. I took it as like he's having some kind of fantasy about, you know, water falls down the river to where she's at. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then he's like, and there's her house. And then I think I feel like it's in that moment of modulation that he realizes I'm not there, uh -huh. or we're not together. Maybe the major or is him thinking of how good she's got it away from him. <laughs> she's okay. <laughs> or something. Though, yeah, right? I don't really know why they're apart, but look at the next verse. Advice. You know of snow. You know of my longings. Tell me where goes your way. Where are you going? Where's your way taking you? Follow after only my tears. It's a little clunky because I'm going word by word here, but the brook will soon take you up, carry you away. And he repeats it. So his tears are eventually joining this melted snow and he knows it's going to get carried away. And that maybe ties into what you were saying to the view about how it's unresponsive, but it is getting carried away. And just his grief is just joining life. It's like the circle of life thing. It's the uh, it's the water cycle. Terrific. It's just absorbed into, <laughs> into the world. Yeah, it's, it, maybe it's that his grief is sort of lost on the world, but maybe it's it's part of something with a cycle to it, and maybe that does hold a little bit of hope in there. This idea that my tears are just going to join in this bigger process, and don't stand out. And isn't that true? Your grief is this big thing. And then it starts to fade and just become part of the backdrop of your life. And you can even think back on a very tough thing and it just doesn't have the same ooh anymore. You know, it's lost its edge, that memory. In fact, I think some of my worst adventures, and I think, aren't those the ones that <laughs> I talk about most? You know, those are the ones that I recant with a smile, even though it was like, you know, camping somewhere in the middle of the night and you're completely rained out and your whole, your sleeping bag's wet and you wake up and you're miserable, but by golly, I tell that story quite a bit. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. It's like the pain is absorbed overall. And maybe that's part of this too, at least when you take in the bigger context. I think, however, that the music here is responding mainly to the first verse and not so much to the second. Okay, so we're, we've talked about these contrasts in the text, and and how the heat of his of his pain is in contrast to the coldness of the snow, um, and how the snow then seems to just absorb it, and it looks kind of small in the big picture. Okay, now let's turn to the music. Mainly, we we wanted to see what a Shankarian approach reveals about this piece. So what do you think? What does a Shankarian approach do? What does it help you highlight? Why would you use a Shankarian approach to this piece? I think it helps highlight when something out of the ordinary happens. Right on. That's good. So what would it highlight here? Um, it highlights and measure. Um, when you listen, when I listened to this piece the first time, I thought that where it says V, that it would be the tonic chord. You know that the tonic chord would happen there mm -hmm. because of how it was previously, mm -hmm. and it doesn't mm -hmm. at all. Like it's like a, a secondary dominant, and then it goes to like a fully diminished seven of something, and it just—it's surprising. It's very different. You when you when you listen to it, and then you, when you look at it, you understand. <coughs> How we did that. Yeah. It's even like a scale leading up to that. I was mm -hmm. like, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so what are some things that set you up to think that tonic is on the way? Can you sort of dramatize this a little bit? Okay, you just heard what? Why don't you walk it through with me? First, we hear four measures of introduction. Mm -hmm. One, five, one. We're, we're 
pretty simple, right? Arpeggiation going on, triplets, a little rhythmic complexity, but pretty basic because it's just one, five, one. Yeah, the tonic's embellished a little bit. There's some neighbor chords there. Where are those five, four, threes? So a little embellishment of tonic, dominant tonic, and we're done in four bars. What happens next? It repeats the first two measures. Basically. Yeah, very similar to the intro. Try a uh, triplet upward. Mm -hmm. And then coming down, is that what you mean? Measure one looks a lot like. Like measure, measure five. nine and ten. Oh, oh five, you're you're talking is, you're making yeah. a comparison between yeah, phrases one and two of the vocal part, not comparing back to the intro. Oh uh, no, not to the intro. Okay, okay. So you, when you, yeah, you're talking about measure five matching measure nine. Mm -hmm. Okay. First, what happens first in the second system? What is that? It's an arpeggiation of the minor Yeah, as a whole though. In the first, in it is. Five. It is. You can you can view it as base arpeggiation. That's true. But what is measures five through eight? System two. What is this? We've had a four bar intro. Now what happens? A phrase. A four, a four bar phrase. A four bar phrase. And what kind of cadence? I don't think it. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So we've got it. We've got an intro that goes for four, and now we get four bars. The end and an I C. What was this cadence here? There's an I C as well. Yeah, I know that's really imperfect. Very open ended because you got scale degree five up there. Now I got three. Okay, so what do you expect now? The next phrase, as you said, starts similarly. So if we call this A, this is gonna be A prime maybe because we've got some differences, but it starts the same. Mm -hmm. Parallel. Mm -hmm. It looks like we should be getting what here? Mm, you would think that if you avoid ultimate closure that you're going to get it next. Right. Especially if you start similarly. So we expect this. Now we get it. Mm -hmm. Where would you expect it to happen given the pattern? Measure 12. Measure 12. Yeah, done that for long. In four bars we would expect to be done but this is not four. This is how long? Six. He extended it for two bars. That's unexpected. Okay, what are some other reasons why in measure 12 you would expect closure? Because there is an ascending motion with the... Yeah. He goes up the same. Do, re, mi, fa. But it doesn't end in the tonic. Right. It goes somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Now, it is one up top, scale mm -hmm. degree one. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's underneath it that's surprising? You already said it, go ahead. On. Uh, secondary dominant of minor four. Of four, okay. And what came before it? I'm trying five to dramatize a little bit here. You There's expect five. something, be, you expect tonic because? There's a five seven. Because five, There's seven, seven, five four. seven. We get a condensal six four. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and there's a seventh in there too, isn't there? To the F? Yeah. Okay, so you're on 5-7, and you want tonic. You want that scale degree 7 to go to scale degree 1, and you want that 5-7 chord to go to the chord, the tonic triad. That's what you expect. What are some things that make this especially dramatic and startling? Oh, and by the way, um, you also mentioned, Lamprini, that it changes quality in the midst of that bar, and that's even more tension. So you expect a triad and you get a seventh chord. Um, five, seven, actually it's an inversion, right? Seven, six, five. Yeah, so let's get the figures in there too. Five, six, five, a four. That's pretty unstable, but then seven to minus seven is even more <laughs> unstable. Seven to minus seven, a four. That quality is just, you know, you can't leave it there. It's almost the antithesis of tonic. Yeah, this is a resolution. He really veered off from where we'd expect. Okay, so what are some ways in which um, Schubert highlights this moment as being something that should be dramatic and amazing? He even puts a breath there. What? To, it lingers because of that um, eighth breath. 
Mm-hmm. He leaves you hanging there. So yeah, and gives you like, a rest after this. So you get. So you it's really point. uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's the you're, part where he's following the part. You're aware that you haven't resolved because he's left you hanging. Good point. Other things. Um, the fortune piano and the accompaniment. I think that's an accent on the um, seven minutes. Um, to really mm -hmm. highlight that. In the piano, you got the accent. No, it's in the it's on the seven minutes. Yeah, it's on, on the next mm -hmm. part of it. On the four minutes seven. Initially, when I when I was an out or doing the analysis. I wrote 565 five over 4, and then I changed it to a 7 fully diminished. And then I put like 6 to 7, because mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. for that made it more dramatic to me to think of the fact that if he wasn't doing two different chords, mm -hmm. I began to hear it as him. Like, it's not a suspension because there wasn't a C before, but it's a, you know, it's a neighboring tone, but he, he holds out that C but really he's just waiting to resolve. He's waiting to get the resolve, so. You have to interpret in the season, accent and passing tone. Right. Getting you, so you're not stopping there, you're saying we go on to, mm -hmm. what is this now? That's a D flat maybe. Which is flat two. Whoa. So we go on to flat two even, that's. Let's say a couple other things too. We're getting into dynamics and that's good. We get the, the rest. After even the text to use is there. Seven, seven, four. But notice some other things. Oh, and we didn't say the most obvious thing going on. What's the vocalist going to do dynamically? Let's finish that before we jump on. We've done a crescendo decrescendo right there. Right into the seven to minute seven. <clears throat> and another crescendo to get you there. So. In the piano, we're doing right. this already. Right. So there, there's a bunch of crescendo leading up to it. Um, I'd say crescendo, a couple of them. And so that's a, that's a big deal. He's saying, bring this out, make something of it, grow dynamically to get up to that spot. Um, the melody, let's say the melody's ascent, that's a big deal. And it, it, so it's one, but it's an octave up. So let me write eight. How about that? Does that make sense? We're, we're too high. Hmm. So even if you just sing it, it doesn't sound like you can really end there, even without the harmony. And then we go past it to this, if you want flat nine, I guess, to continue up. But you know what I mean. We go on to flat two. That's pretty unstable. We already talked about the harmony. We expect... Tonic, oops, minor. We expect a minor one, but we get these very unstable things that we wrote up there already. And we can get further than five, six, five, or four. We get to this fully diminished seventh of four. Very uh, tense, in need of resolution. The melody and the harmony working together to create a lot of tension. Anything else that he does to highlight this moment? There's no dotted eighth, sixteenth note where there's so much of that in the bass and there he's holding notes longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where do we put our, our rest thing? Um, really these, these three things belong together the rest here, and then also, you're saying now we're, we're pretty much holding out. Mm -hmm. We're sustaining a lot of things, so the activity stops. <coughs> when, you, when you take an inherently unstable thing, and then you dwell on it, mm -hmm. that breeds tension. You know, if you stop on something that's, that's um, stable, then that stability is enhanced. But if you've got something that needs to resolve, <coughs> and you don't let it, tension rises. So that's a good point. I don't know quite how to write, write that, but the sustaining, the change in rhythms mm -hmm. when you come up. You got such a tickle, I know I'm going to have to cough. I'm going to have to go get a 
I'm gonna go get something to drink and then I won't have to cry. I'll be back. I'm just gonna like circle um, this point to my answer. It's so, like yeah, all of these things are plus this. Up with class. Yeah, plus this. <laughs> I know, no joke. Are you talking about your essays? Yeah. I'm like, I just, I'm like, can I start writing again? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> just like circle it. Can I just put extra things in here? And on the way to handwrite in Times New Roman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll email it to you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a lot of good. <laughs> it's almost empty. I'll get more later. I did wet my whistle, so maybe it'll last for a few minutes anyway. Anything you wanted to add to this? The whole text, even the text for three. Yeah, we already, yeah, we talked about that, but it's worth a second. Because we're going to have to cancel class. You think I can? Yeah, this is actually interesting, so. That wasn't your last week, I was sick. And if you miss like one week, you can put it off because that's how I was this whole week. The reading is like the Yeah, I missed talking for a moment and a half. And we're leaving early today. I'm not sure. I'm just going to wait for you. Okay. Well, he's like, be proud. You know, he hates when people are late. Well, but he didn't have a class. It's just the way he and he goes and forth like that. Five past three. We take it longer, you know. It's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is going to be my best friend today. <laughs> <laughs> Close by. All right, so, yes, that's right. We've got text now. I said they, um, <clears throat> that's important that the heat is at this very moment that we're really high in register and all these other things we've talked about. That's, that's a good point. Do you notice something else too? You So, right. Why did he have to do it twice? This is Schubert's decision, you know. The text doesn't repeat that. The original poem doesn't have two statements. See what he's repeating? Durstig ein das heiße weh. He says that twice, and that's his choice. The composer's choice, not the poet's. Why did he do that? I think it is a, and to demonstrate this final descent back to the cadence, that we're finally going back into this pain, and this grief is finally going to come to a close, I hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you're going to do it big, you got to do it again to bring it down. I think the repetition you need so you don't forget, too. Like kind of how he did in the beginning. He repeated those things to really bring more emphasis. Is this absorbing maybe the pain into... Yeah, I think kind of like, ah, and then you're like, okay. You know what I mean? Like, you're like reaching out, like, oh my gosh, I'm in so much pain. And then you're like, okay, I'm in pain. Like, you're dealing with it now. Mm -hmm. I yeah, think maybe the, the one phrase, the first phrase of um, the V is more about the person who sings it and their pain, and the second one is more about the s snow and the absorbing, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. That's how I yeah, that's oh, good. Yeah. Okay, so now mm -hmm. that we've looked at all this stuff, we realize that this is an important moment, 11 going into 12, and especially measure 12 itself. That's important. What does a Schenkerian approach help us see? What does it show off about this? <coughs> it shows 
in measure, especially in measure 11 and 12, that through that whole section it's embedded in that it's not moving anywhere, and then all of a sudden the, at the end is where you see the final descent. Mm -hmm. This is where I go. Yeah, we so find the descent after yeah. this. Does that make sense to have the normal come later? Can you go further with that? What's the Shankarian approach highlighting about this? The expansion of tonic, how long it goes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. At the beginning. Can let's let's go a little further with that. So we go. Let's just sketch this out real quick. You know, I want, <clears throat> I really want the next phrase, so I'm going to skip over this business. <coughs> but for the moment, since I already did it, I might as well just do a couple things here. Notice that there's already a covering tone going on. A note that's higher than the fundamental line. Even here, and that sets the stage for what happens later. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. This is arpeggiation all through that same chord, but it's the G that's going to be picked up. We know, let's go ahead and finish out this thing. So we go here, then we get to the dominant. Does he put it down there or does it go up? Probably down here. Yeah, one five. He goes down for the five and back up. Now, <clears throat> okay, so in the big scheme of things, this whole phrase is expansion of tonic, mm -hmm. opening tonic. And it's especially important because we're not all the way done yet. Is that our descent? Is that the no, fundamental line going down? No, no, because it's too early. Our frame of reference is why our scope takes in the next phrase, too. And if you're looking at it from that perspective, that's what Schenker's all about. It's about getting perspective on the detail. If your perspective is this big, phrase one, then that's tonal motion. Right? Progression. Five, back to one. You've gone away, you've come back. That's progression. But if you back up far enough, you realize, now wait a minute, that, that's activity, but it's on a lower level. It's down in the foreground. It's not as significant as the, the motion, the progression that will occur later. <clears throat> so, Schenker doesn't say, this is motion and this isn't. He says, well, what level is it motion at? You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. At what level does this represent motion? And at what level does it become prolongation? In the end, everything's prolongation of what? The one. Of the tonic the tonic. C minor in this case. So the tonic absorbs everything into it by the end, if your perspective is the whole piece. Right? That's interesting. So it's not that he, he He's making the distinction on a given level, but in a way, he's kind of like the snow absorbs the, the tears. Tonic absorbs everything into its orbit. All right, so you put my tonic in motion. You know that. <laughs> no extra charge for that one. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, now we need phrase two. Regain the sky, and we say, hey, oh, we're back where we started. That's my G coming back, and now I'm ready for my descent, we think. Covering tone still hanging up up there. Okay, and now. <clears throat> We've got to get down. I'm not going to worry about that because I'll run out of room if I do. So make a little break in there. Okay. And I'm going to pick up with measure 11 right here. And now we get to the exciting stuff. We're down on a G. And then we pick up from that G.
to do my baseball now too. So, um, this. This. Measure 11. Come from our one again, reiterate it. So what the, what the middle ground will do is it will isolate the things that are really closure producing that are normal and that are found in a lot of other pieces. The excitement <coughs> is not at the, at the middle ground, but we want to see how this relates to the middle ground. How do you get between levels in Schenker? How do you create a middle ground, or how do you create the foreground from the middle ground? How about that? Because that's more of his perspective. You know this is the middle ground. You're going to have a five line. That's no big deal. How do you get the other notes? What's the process of getting to new and more detailed? The main levels? motion. The main motion in the, here. In the big picture. Good. Now how do I get more detail? What's this called? That's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> what do you do? Is that like the fundamental structure? There's, There's the fundamental right. structure. You know that's going to happen. You got and a five line. embellishments. You just add embellishments. Words. Remember our little mm -hmm. diagram? When you compose, you add embellishments. That's when you go the other way, you prune it back. You reduce it down to the reduce. bare bones. Mm -hmm. I like what you were saying, Marcel, earlier today. Skeleton. Skeleton. Mm -hmm. And then you flesh it out mm -hmm. till you get all the nuances. You know. Ears and nose and all the stuff that depends on the skeleton, the bone structure. Thing. That's a good analogy. I just wish there was some sort of rule, really, of how to do a middle ground because the the foreground and the background. I think these two I can kind of, but with the middle ground, it just is so ambiguous. You know, you pick and choose. I don't. It doesn't make sense. It is ambiguous. I agree. It's in, it's interpretation. Yeah, and I don't, if I'm t sometimes I think I'm not really interpreting. I'm just trying to find another note to connect another note. You're actually doing a great job. So you just need to do I more of it. <laughs> do you more? Need, you need to just look at what you're doing right and go, oh, that's working, okay. and, and keep doing it. It takes a lot of time to get comfortable with it, but you're doing a great job with your graphs. So um, just see what's going well and keep doing it. These were not real graphs, I don't think. Okay, why can't I just do this? Right? Why did you do that? I'm sure you did that too. It's late, and it shows how I get the closure by step. Easy, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't take a lot of effort. What, what takes effort is not to find my descent from G, but what takes effort is figuring out how in the world do we get all this mess, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get up to C, and how do we, this C, way up high, and then that D flat? That's what takes explaining, and that's why the middle ground is so exciting because you got to make all these decisions there you can't just go paint by number you know mm -hmm. you got to make creative decisions mm -hmm. how are you going to perform it how is it related to the things around it Schenker forces you to decide these questions how mm -hmm. does it how are you elaborating these basic things mm -hmm. okay so so here's our descent we know what's happening that's easy we're coming from this note over here that's the beginning <clears throat> it's reiterated here and then we get the descent. Harmonically, we go five to one at the beginning. Here's our one at the be at the very beginning, reiterated at the beginning of phrase two. Okay, so here's our boss bracken for this phrase. <clears throat> okay, now let's deal with some of the details. You expect this to be the structural dominant one that gets you the closure, but you're led astray. This is kind of like a tonic. You know, I could do this. I could say, oh, I think that this is going to be my base arpeggiation right there, moving through tonic. But I'm fooled because this is not the normal three that I should get. Mm -hmm. It's a leading tone to something. So in a sense, it's resolving things. The leading tone resolves. The dominant resolves sort of. You see what I mean? serving like a tonic substitute. Mm -hmm. It can absorb the energy of the dominant because it's got one in there. 
It's got scale degree one and the leading tone can resolve. But at the same time, it has another meaning. So I'm going to leave this slower. I'm just going to show it as related back to here. But it's also not right. So if we put a T there, we'd have to say tonic substitute. It's not really working out to bring ultimate closure stability. That's not happening. So in the end, we look at it and go, now wait a minute, that becomes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thought it, it's an incomplete neighbor to this, but then this is an incomplete neighbor to this over here. Let's join these because this is a four chord, later inverted. See the relationship with the top part? What's going on here? What's this called? Voice exchange. Voice exchange. Good. So I can join these as well and then show the X thing that shows that those two lines have swap notes between them. Nice. Okay. The voice exchange there. And this is my this is my predominant dominant tonic that's going to close it out. That's my progression. This tonic expansion in the in the big scheme of things and now progression okay now top part I could use a symbol here this is a high note and I want to show that it actually is an inner voice entity how can I do that it's a covering tone how can I show that Good, registral shift will work. Do you see the source for that note? Where's the inner voice? A flat. Yes. Can you see what register it's at? It's one octave lower. And it's written on the treble class, so I'll put it there too. It's there. Can we get the G? This one? Mm -hmm. Do we get this F? Actually, it's going to be down here, isn't it? Look at it. F down in the left hand now. But it's exactly the F that you would expect. Still an octave lower. Let me just show that, that, that I am moving that line down. That's not a register shift, but I'm just showing that I'm moving where I write it from the treble to the bass part. And then, you see the resolution to that note? That F has to resolve, do you know why? Why does that F need to resolve? Coral 7. Coral 7 comes down, yeah, down my step. Okay, can I go further? Can I show that some of these notes here, A flat, G, F, can I see that this line actually stems from other inner voice notes? Yeah, you see the C? doubled an octave below. See the D flat doubled an octave below. And C, so D flat down here. There is no passing tone to get me from C down to the A flat and do this little thing here. But when we rewrite it, we might show that this could have happened down below. All these notes All those notes are from an inner voice. So this is registral shift. Something that belongs in the inner voice ends up above the main melodic line. Is that the same as cover, cover tone? Yes, they're okay. covering tone. The process is registral shift, what well, gets them up there. But then once they're there, because of where they are, they become covering tones. Instead of writing them down an octave lower, could you have done the the beam that goes diagonal? That's where I was going at first, oh, okay. actually. So before when I was asking where oh. these, I wasn't actually thinking this. I was thinking you could do, go ahead and tell me what should I do here? What's that called? Connect it to the F. I forget what it's called though. What is it called? Unfolding. unfolding. Yeah, unfolding would make this really clear that you're trying to get that note as an inner voice. What about the B flat? I mean, could it? Be an octave lower? It could have been, but it isn't actually showing up there. There is no, no chord to, e -flat to go with it. And I think it's because of what you were talking about. 
He just wants dead air for a sec. Uh, and what uh, Genevieve was talking about, the rest. So sustaining and resting at the end breeds extra tension. And to leave the voice hanging and the only one to present that note makes it feel very tenuous mm -hmm. right there. So I think it's for the effect that he doesn't do it. But we can do this. We can say, if this, if we carry this further, we would have a B flat there. And at the middle ground, we can restore it to an inner voice status okay. and put it there. <clears throat> yeah, this has got to be an important note, right? This C, because it does resolve the leading tone. That's good. By the way, I don't want yours to match mine, so if yours is not matching, don't go and change it. Uh, I want to see what you did instead of you writing what I did, because that won't help me help you at all. This is an incomplete neighbor, I would say, to it. And this is a passing tone that gets us C, B flat, A flat, gets us down. Now, here's our main note. Our, you remember what that's called? Kopfzone, or in English, did you see the, res the uh, translation in the cook? Kopfzone, or head tone, is the no, primary, primary tone. tone. Right. The primary tone, the note from which the descent departs. Okay, so we know that. We're going down from the G. This G is still here because it's a common, it's, it's part of this chord and it's part of that chord. It could have just been there the whole time, this G. But he's, he's revisiting some of this motion in the inner part. In fact, we could just sort of trace this thing. Isn't it called the primary tone because it's the fifth scale degree of the triad? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be the fifth. It's just the note from which the descent oh, okay. comes. And there are three different options. There. It could be the octave of right, for an yeah, octave the one, eight, the five, five line, or a three line. So it's not because it's five, but it's because it's I was just trying to remember the reason why they called it the primary tone. I thought I read it's that. because it's where the descent. Right. Okay. Yeah, right. It's what the descent stems from. Okay. okay. So we can trace some of this inner voice motion, something like that. We could do that, and we can pick it up here again, or maybe I should put it up here again. Okay. So it's interesting that the C continues here, goes here. So it's pedaled. Oh, so maybe we should put the B down as well. B natural could have been down in an inner voice and gone here. But if we keep the C in mind, it's really neighboring motion in that inner voice, isn't it? See that? Look at the B in the voice part that leads you into measure 12. That leading tone is down in an inner voice. And if the voice leading hadn't been all shifting to move up here, by all rights it should have been C going down here as we do our 6, 4, going to 5, 3. So that happens here, I think. When this motion happens, the fourth above the bass should have gone down here and then resolved in that register. So, yes, I can slur from here to here because now we're over the dominant, and that's G and B five and seven parts of that chord. But in the end, in the middle ground, you want to show that that B actually belongs in an inner part. Okay, so now, what, is, what does all this show you about Schenkerian analysis? What does the Schenkerian analysis show you about this piece? I like the important um, tones, the things that need to be seen as shows. That's the most important thing to be sung and brought out. Mm -hmm. And these are the things. They're the not embellishment, this. right? The embellishments, yeah. Mm -hmm. It highlights those embellishments because we have to exert a lot of energy to figure out what in the world they're doing there. <laughs> How are they embellishing? We've got to figure that out. So the, the descent, once you get to the F, this is run of the mill. This is normal stuff. What's interesting is how you get there. And this takes a lot of energy, in a sense, because you're having, Schubert is having to take things that would have just been tucked away underneath the, underneath the radar, so to speak, and he pulls those events up and makes <coughs> a climax out of it. A huge climax that's loud and high and tense and wonderful. 
very neat. So this process helps you see that certain things just create closure, descend as they should, and are very stable, but other things are special to this piece, and those are important expressively for this text. It helps express the heat of this pain. Okay, any comments? The relationship between notes, like highlighting important relationship with notes, like slur. Mm -hmm. You're asking a question? That's true. <laughs> you want to know the relationship yes. of each note? Every. Yes, to the things around it. And take a compound melody and show how it results from multiple lines. This melody does a lot of skipping around. Yeah, it's filled in by passing motion here, here, and here. But it's, it's moving between different lines to create one melody. Yeah. How did, I mean, because you told us that the um, primary tone was five, you know, that, I mean, that helped out a lot to know where to start. But if you hadn't said that, I would have started with that C. Mm -hmm. So. If you start with the C, yeah, you what do you have to do then to see if that's actually going to work? In other words, as a very practical thing, how would you determine if that could work as an octave line? See whether it, whether there is a stepwise descent, but it doesn't have the harmonic support. Yeah, and it's the uh, yeah. Well, what if I started here? I said, okay, here's my C, and I'm going to come down. Can I do it? I could actually say that hey, that's harmonized. That's part of this. It's pretty unstable, but I could make a case for that. The instability, yeah, it's in, it's unstable, and it needs to go down, but. Still, it does have harmonic support. Where do I run into the most trouble? The G is a passing tone. Oh, wait a minute. I'm looking at a different one. I'm picking these notes now, right? Yes. A flat, G, F. And then notes, uh, what's the problem? That's what the... What's the problem here? Follow <laughs> through with that thought, and then we'll come back. What's, what's wrong? Chord. That, that's a chord tone. But there's no more chords. There's no other support tones. for that. It's embedded. Okay, so what if I even do this? But that's an inner voice, right? Yeah, What's the problem? Reason. What's my fundamental line supposed to do? Get me to? One. 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 Mm -hmm. It's not going to work because it fizzles at the end. It gets me to three. So it would work except it's an octave line to three. So I need, the, I need to pick the one that gets me to one and call that. So you are on a good, I mean, that's a good path. I, I'm just saying that was pursue. what, if, if you hadn't said that, that's what I would have spent a lot of time with. Mm -hmm. What I did also spend a lot of time with, I'm just saying, you know, it's, um, it's tracing that G, you know? Yeah. Because I thought that when you have a primary tone, it has to be maybe on a, a strong B or, you know, there needs mm -hmm. to be, so it doesn't. No. Um, take Cook's advice, and I think I men I've mentioned it too, um, work from the end. Okay. And then back up and see, okay, now if I take this one and back up from it, where does it lead me? Right. Uh, I don't want to take that. That's a passing tone, so I need a G. Got it. That's already over the dominant. I need tonic. Oh, tonic support. Good. There I am. G. Can I use the... I can't use the C. Yeah. See how that works? Yeah. Your process will lead you there very fast if you start from the end of work backwards. Okay. I didn't I did not understand primary tone until just now, but I do now. I feel much better about it. High five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was trying to because I had that I mean this is wrong now, but I couldn't find this the right support because I was trying to find the G at the end. I knew that the C wouldn't work, but I was still trying to find the G at the end because I I didn't know I didn't realize. You didn't realize that it could come way back. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's often a lot of space between, in time, between the opening tonic and sometimes it's left on, and where it finally descends at the end, because it's all about 
trying to get there, trying to get there. Oh, okay, finally getting there. So the, the descent can happen in a really short span of time, and that means there's a huge gap in that quick descent and that opening tonic and the, off in the cup tone. Now, we also know that the cup tone can get delayed and show up later. So you have a, an ascent, Anstieg, and then the descent later on. So there can be this delay, but still it's pretty early a lot of the time, even though it's not right there at the beginning. Yeah. Anything else? Questions? So now maybe you didn't think to do inner voice stuff. You didn't think to model it off of that analysis that we looked at last time. That's okay. There's probably another way to, to work through this. Um, but you know what? Once you realize that that A-flat has got to be a covering tone and that the main descent involves the lower notes in each of those threes, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Once you realize that, then that A-flat's connection to this does not really help. That C has got to be part of covering tone stuff mm -hmm. and can't be integrated the way the other notes can mm -hmm. into that descent. You're kind of stuck. So when you're working backwards, you realize this is a covering tone, covering tone, covering tone, and yes, that's passing motion from the C, but that, if, that's a, if that's not part of the main activity of this line, and it's a covering tone, then that is too. And then so is the B that leads to it. We're stuck down here with the G. We really need to come from that. So a covering tone can never be part of the descent. Right, because that's his definition. It's something that's not part of the descent, okay. but is higher than the descent. Okay, let's listen to two recordings.